one week from today, we're, we're almost there. Pen Relays, a week from today, you're right. That's exactly what I was talking about. Yes, the Pen Relays, one week from today. Also, by the way, the NFL draft starts one week. Oh, from is today. that coming up? <laughs> yeah, I have noticed. The, yeah, there have been like mock drafts or something going around. And there have been mock Pen Relays results too. So, you know, two two big events coming up. But anyway, you still, yes. You fill those out. <laughs> What's that? Do you fill those out, the mock pen relay results? Oh, several. Yeah, I do a couple per week. I figured you would. All right. This is the Eagle Eye Podcast presented by Nissan. That's He's everybody. Frank. I'm Dave Zangaro. Yeah, we're a week away from the draft, and it, it it's an exciting time of year. So a little bit later in this episode, we will chat with Barrett Brooks, our buddy from Bird's Huddle, uh, get a different opinion on uh, on this draft and some of the players we've been talking about for the last few months. So excited to hear some of his takes on this year's class. But before we do that, this week, the Eagles have been back at the NovaCare Complex. It's the start of the offseason program. Uh, April 15th is when they started on Monday. It's phase one, so not really any practices yet. But the guys are back in the building, and we got a chance to talk to a few of them. Yeah, it was a good day. Uh, I talked to Jalen, um, who was pretty chatty. It was good to talk to Jalen. Uh, they brought in uh, BG, uh, Dallas Goddard, uh, Nakobe. Anybody else? Cam Jurgens. Cam Jurgens. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it was it was a good day to catch up and and uh, you know it's really the first time we've talked to these guys since either lock or clean out day or, gosh, I guess we talked to Jalen that day, didn't we? And then. Uh, but some of them really since since right after the right after the playoff game. So a lot's changed since then. The team's different. The coaching staff's different. Certainly their outlook is a lot different. Uh, guys have moved on. Nobody really wanted to talk about last year anymore, and that's the way it should be. So uh, it was a good day to hear from everyone. Yeah, it tells you how long it had been. Jalen Hurts was asked about Brian Johnson no longer being here, and it's like, yeah, we haven't. We haven't talked to you since a, a lot has happened in this coaching staff. So uh, let's kind of go through our big takeaways from chatting with these guys. We can kind of just go back and forth. I'll let you go first. Just what was one takeaway you had from chatting with those guys? Well, my biggest takeaway, and you're right, there there were several. I thought it was a pretty interesting day. Jalen just opening up about how badly he wants consistency in, in play calling. And, you know, we made a big deal about it when Shane Steichen came back for his second year in 2022. It was really his only full year as play caller since he didn't start till, uh, you know, six weeks, seven weeks into 2021. But it was the first time since high school Jalen had the same OC, the same play caller. Um, and he was, he talked about how important that was. And you saw what happened. They, he had his best year. Uh, Eagles went to the Super Bowl. And obviously that didn't last. Shane got the Colts job. And then Brian Johnson came in. He, he got fired. And now Kellen Moore is in. So, it's really four, it's really five offensive coordinators he's had now because Doug, his rookie year, and then Nick, the first half of his second year, and then Shane for a year and a half, and then Brian Johnson, and now Kellen Moore. So um, I thought it was really interesting how, how blunt he was, I guess, about how important it is to have that consistency. And he talked about the offensive linemen, and, and they've had, all these guys have had uh, Jeff Stoutland their whole career. Now that Kelsey's gone, Every offensive lineman on this team, the only position coach they've had as Eagles is Jeff Stoutland, who started here in 13 with Chip. And he talked about how how consistency breeds excellence. And um, he said, you know, the reality is if if you do well, the guy's going to move on and get a head coaching job. That's what happened with Shane, but uh, certainly not not with some of the other guys. Nick demoted himself. Doug got fired and, and Brian Johnson got fired. So... Um, it's an interesting situation, and I think the fact that he had his best year when Shane came back for for another year as OC uh, is telling. And the fact that Jalen and, – and Jalen doesn't open up like this very often. Like He's in interviews, and maybe it's a sign of maturing as, as a player, as a person. He's in his fifth year now. Um, but, I mean, he was he – was, really chatty talking about it very open about it about how important it is to him and uh that was really striking to me yeah i mean it it's kind of a pie in the sky dream to have yeah. that type of continuity at that position especially if your head coach is not the play caller like you're gonna 
and really there's there are no teams in the league that has the same offensive coordinator year over year over year like the head coach might remain the same in a lot of places like the head coach is kind of the de facto offensive coordinator that's how you can find it but otherwise yeah there's no guarantee this there's a high turnover rate of coaches in this league so it's the only way around that is really to have an older guy that's not a head coaching candidate really but is still a good offensive mind i'm not sure you want a guy that doesn't aspire to be a head coach and doesn't maybe have some qualifications to become a head coach i mean last the last oc the eagles had more than two years was pat Shermer, and the last one they had more than three years was marty from 06 to 2012 marty was never going to be a head coach again Uh, but he was pretty good play caller so it really takes a, a combination of a lot of things that are unlikely for it to happen. Yeah, and you look at Kellen Moore. I mean, what are the chances he's the offensive coordinator here in in two, three years? Yeah, I mean, even next year, I think it's 50-50. I mean, yeah, uh, yeah we'll see. But, I mean, he's already been identified as a as a head coaching candidate. He's interviewed for jobs. So if, if the offense does well, then he's going to have opportunities quite likely. I mean, there's 10 new head coaches every year. And if he does really poorly, they'll probably get someone else in here with these weapons if you don't have a great offense. So I guess the only way he stays is if he doesn't get a head coaching job and, you know, they're really good on offense. But um, it's possible, certainly. But um, it was just interesting to hear Jalen talk about what a, uh, you know, I guess handicap it is to not have that same. And I, I think it does kind of compound it when it's every year. And he, it was the same thing in Alabama. I mean, he, you know, he had Lane Kiffin his true freshman year, and then he left before the bowl game to take a head coaching job. And he had a different guy every year at Bama. And then he had Lincoln Riley at Oklahoma. And then he gets here. So uh, it's been since, you know, gosh, it's been since senior or high school when his dad was his coach. Yeah. Um, and he, he did mention that there's a lot to learn, which makes you think, you know, I, I tried to get Nick to answer that question at the owners meetings about the terminology of this offense. And if they'd keep it or if they'd change it based on that answer from Jalen, it seems like they are changing a lot of the terminology to Kellen Moore terms, which I think is significant when you're talking about them building this offense. Yeah, no doubt. And again, we, every time you change coordinator or, or, or play callers, you're most likely going to have a new set of terminology, a new voice, a new way of doing things, a new way of practicing uh, in, in a lot of cases. So um, not just the it's not just the plays that change. Uh, everything changes. You know, James is a smart guy, and he'll pick up on it, and that's why OTAs are so important because you get that head start so you have it mastered going into training camp. But it, it's a lot. Yeah, and that kind of leads me to my next thing was, you know, he said, you know, the coaching staff right now, they're putting the offense together. And I asked him, you know, how involved in that process are you? And he made it seem like not very right now. He said he's in sponge mode. He wants them to set the foundation of the the offense, whatever it's going to be, before he then gives his input and they kind of tailor it to his strengths. Because he said he wants the offense to have that foundation before anything else, which really means like, what are we offensively? Like, what's beyond scheme or terminology like what are we philosophically that's how you have to build it yeah and that was another interesting quote i thought i thought it was it was, it was and like I mean, he will have a voice in there um, but he's just not ready for that and i i think that's probably a good thing i i think i think for him to you know just focus on learning right now is is probably the the best thing to do and and there'll be a time certainly when when he'll he'll have a voice in that room in that offense, but I don't think it's it's now. Yeah. Anything else from Jalen that stuck out to you? No. Um I just thought it was one of the best interviews he's ever done since he's been here. And uh look, I really like the kid, um, but his interviews have not been very illuminating since he's been here. And personally, it doesn't look I, I can write about the guy whether he says anything or not, but I think it's good for the fans to really get you know, more of a window into his thought process and his thinking. Um, look, he's not going anywhere. He's going to be this team's quarterback for a long time. And um, to have a guy who's, you know, opens up a little like he did when he wasn't being interrupted by some of our media brethren, 
the guy's got a great quote going and people just interrupt him. It drives me crazy, Dave. Uh, but, um, but yeah, I think it's, it's good. I think it's a good thing for him to, uh, to, to be open and it, and it, for fans to know what's, what's on his mind. I mean, he's a quarterback. So, uh, but no, I think those were the, the main, the main takeaways from Jalen. I had one other one. Yeah. It was a question, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing the question here, but Jalen has said before different years require different things from him. Uh, so he was asked, like, what does this year require from you? And his answer was that he wants to leave it to no one else to set the culture. He wants to be the one to do it. And he said he wants to communicate that with everyone, including the people above him, which I found... Yeah, like a little curious. Like, wh- who's he talking about there? Yeah. Is he talking about the coaching staff? He's talking about Nick in particular. But I, I found that noteworthy, that he wants to be the one to, to set the temperature and to kind of uh, set the tone for the team, which, yeah, I get that. You know, he's the quarterback. He's now in year five, like you mentioned. They're going to go as far as he takes them, and they're going to take on his personality in a lot of ways. So, uh I understand that it's his team, especially now that Jason Kelsey's gone and Fletcher Cox is gone. There's no question anymore. It's his team. Yeah. And I wonder if part of that, it was an interesting comment. And I wonder if part of it is if he was disappointed in that culture last year and we saw what happened at the end of the year. And maybe he feels like if it was more his team, if, if, if he had been more, I guess, vocal about, about sharing his thoughts and, uh, then maybe they could have avoided what happened the last two months of the year. I, I don't know. I'm speculating now, but it was an interesting thing to say. Um, and I, I, I'm all for it. I mean, I'm all for him um, taking that as, as far as he can take it. Yeah. All right. I, I think that was probably you know, most of what Jalen Hurts had to say. How about from someone else? Was there something else that that really kind of? It was stuck a out lot, here? and I, you know, I we got a little tidbit of news from uh, Cam Jurgens, who and Cam was really interesting in his own right, talking about himself, um, following a Hall of Famer. But you know, the, and we've talked before about how the lockers in that back right corner of the locker room are set up from, you know, it was always Jason Peters in the in the far left, and then whoever was playing left guard, and then Kelsey in the middle, and it was it was laid out like. I, it goes back to Doug. It was laid out like they they line up, and then the right guard it was say Amalo or whoever, um, and and then Lane was was the fifth one, and then there's the door to the lounge. Well, Cam was asked, and I couldn't tell who asked the question. Um, uh, you, it was coming. It was from your side of the room. No, uh, no, it was Elliot. I thought, it was I, Elliot. I thought he looked. I thought he looked toward toward to to his left, um, but well, I when, corrected. Yeah, I mean, when he he offered the information that he now took over Kelsey's locker, so he moved right. one over, and then he was asked to follow up. Well, who's in the locker next to you on the right side? And that's when he said it's Tyler Steen. And that's look, it's it's a funny way to find out who the right guard is, uh, but that's how they do things. Now it doesn't mean he's going to start seventeen games, but it means he's got the first crack at the starting right guard job if his locker is there before and- the draft, at least. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Before the draft, um, inter- it's interesting. And look, there's not a lot of options, so it's not a huge shock. Um, Matt Hennessy's been a left guard; he could probably play right guard, uh, but I think they like having him as a, the top inside backup. Um, there's really nobody else. So I mean, Sue is gone, Jack Driscoll's gone, so there's not a lot of options. But it's still noteworthy um, that they've they've kind of that they've put him there in that fourth spot uh, between uh, Cam and uh, and Lane. So, um, you know, we'll see. He was third-round pick last year. He played the one game against Dallas. I thought he played okay. I really didn't play again after that um, because they had Sua um, playing right guard until Cam came back from from that injury. Um, so we'll see. I, I don't really know. I don't I don't have a, a real clear sense of of Tyler Steen. Uh, I thought he he battled in that one game, and look, he was playing against a pretty good front, uh, Dallas, uh, some pretty good uh, D linemen, and and he hung in there. A lot to work on, but uh, at least we know what they're thinking. Yeah, I think 
the real thing here is there's not really anyone else to put there right now. Right. And I, you know, if, if they draft a guy in the first round who's either an interior lineman or a tackle who can play guard, then I think, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that Tyler Steen is still your starter. We've seen before, too, that, you know, they, they're not beholden to the <laughs> to the order. You know, there was in, what, 2017, we saw um, – uh, Sam Alu got benched and then his locker was still there. Uh, Brandon Brooks, remember, got hurt and then Landon Dickerson was starting. So, uh, yeah, it's not like, like whoever started, they moved their locker that week. <laughs> yeah, but, like Tyler Steen will be there all year no matter right. what, yeah, but it's how they start out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, we'll see if if that changes. And look, I, I think it was a little concerning that they went with Sua for as long as they did last year. And the only time Tyler Steen got a chance to start that game was when Sua had that hip injury. He was a little banged up. I mean, a third round pick, you would think if, if all things were equal, he would have gotten that opportunity. Yeah. Over an undrafted guy, an undrafted veteran. I I think one thing we were learning is that Nick or somebody in that, co- you know, somebody, they, they're really slow to play rookies. They don't want to play rookies. And whether, I mean, how many times on the podcast last year, do we complain that Sydney wasn't playing? Keeley wasn't playing. And by the end of the year, they were both contributing. Now, on the one hand, you say, well, they should have been playing earlier because they're 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 helping out here. On the other hand, if they had played earlier, maybe they wouldn't have been playing as well. So I, I think there's two schools of thought on that. I, look, I think if a guy's ready, you play him. And um, but Nick does not see. And I remember asking him about this. He said, No, that's not true. Devontae played as a rookie. Well, yeah, some guys plays. <laughs> yeah, oh, you mean the Heisman Trophy winner, number ten overall pick, played when you exactly. had two other receivers? Exactly. Um, but I mean, even you know, Jalen Carter wasn't starting. I mean, he was playing a lot. But um, there's no question they're slow to play rookies, and they believe there's value in that, and and there may be. Uh, so that might be part of it. But I'm with you that I would have liked to seen. I would have liked to seen Tyler Steen play over Sua. I'm I think not even Sue I would have liked to. I'm just saying I, I think it I think there would have been some value in it. And I, I think Sue is pretty good. I think Sue is uh, probably a, you know, was a little bit better player, a little bit better guard than Tyler Steen, but I just think there's value in playing young guys. Yeah, I I'm a little curious of what they really think of Tyler Steen. I'm not so sure they have the highest opinion of him. No, I think that might be possible. I also think he he hasn't played a whole lot. Um I mean, I, like you said, the fact that Sua got that job right back when he was healthy is a little concerning. Um, we'll see. I mean, I think, um, you know, we just listened to Howie the other day talk about how uh, you never judge rookies by their rookie. You never judge players by their rookie year, and you got to give them time. So, um, you know, we'll see. It's going to be – look, if they trade up and and get a, a – an inside outside offensive lineman. You're right. That guy's going to be the favorite to start at right guard. But until that happens, it'll be Steen. Sure. Uh the other stuff from Jorgens, uh look, I I I never questioned whether or not he was a center, but he clearly is the starting center on this team. He's, what are you saying there, Dave? <laughs> I'm saying other people questioned it and talked about moving the, the Pro Bowl left guard to center. I, I just threw it out there. Yeah, I did. I okay. threw it out there. I didn't. I said it was not likely, but okay. I did say it was an option, uh, and still is. I'm going to double down on that. Still is. Yeah, I mean, no. I, I guess mean, look, Cam signing me to play center isn't completely off the table, right? Like I'm in the right. building, That's might right. as well get me in there, but it's, not likely. There's a chance, but it's not likely. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm very curious to see how Cam performs this year. I think he has the right mind frame yeah. going into this because it it has to be, even though he's known that he's eventually going to replace Jason Kelsey for two years now, it's finally here, and that's got to be a little daunting. But I, I think at least from a physical standpoint, he has the ability. It's just, you know, he's, he doesn't have the experience. He hasn't played in this league for over a decade, and I, I think there is going to be a drop-off. And I, I think – He played last year. What? He said he hasn't played in over a decade. He played last year. I'm I'm misunderstanding you. He doesn't have the experience of playing for over a decade. Oh, I see what you mean. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah I think I certainly think a year at guard, um, at right guard helps. I mean, I thought he said all the right things. Uh, I don't think the 
I don't think the following a Hall of Famer thing will affect him. I don't think it'll bother him. Um, he seems to be wired the right way to be able to handle it. And, you know, he said, look, I'm, I'm not Jason Kelsey. I can't go out there and try to be Jason Kelsey. Um, I can just be the best version of me wherever they put me. And I think you have to look at it like that. Um, yeah, I like, I like his approach. Yeah. He was asked a little bit about, you know, the, the mental side of the game and making calls, which is, you know, that was a big part of Kelsey's game, especially the last second half of his career, right? He became just this cerebral guy who did a lot up front. I think those responsibilities are going to be shared a little bit this year by Cam Jurgens, by Jalen Hurts, even Landon, um, who has the experience, who has a background as a center. I think that like football knowledge helps him, but some of it is going to be on Jurgens' plate a little bit. Yeah, and I think he can handle that. And uh, but yeah, it's it's definitely a different role. It's a new role. I mean, he's got to snap the ball too, and a lot. You know, it's it's a it's a more challenging position. I, I just think having last year. Um, it's not like he's coming into this cold and he's never played in the league. Um, so, you know, we'll see. I, I think he's going to be at worst. I think he'll be fine. I don't know if he's ever going to be a pro bowler, be a star. Although I was looking at the numbers like Stoutland, Stoutland's coached 20. I think he's had 21 offensive linemen start at least one game, but only nine have started 30 games and six of those nine have made a pro bowl. Isn't that interesting? Um, so if you're a, if you're a starter for two years, you're you have seventy percent chance to make it a Pro Bowl. Yeah, I don't know if that works for everyone. I think he's had really talented players here. That too, but I think he's a really good coach too. But I, I think Cam's in good hands with him. Um, look, it's his third year here. Um, he knows the. If only Jamon Brown got twenty nine more starts. That's right. That's right. He was on the brink. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's crazy how many right guards they've they've played since Brandon Brooks initially got hurt but anyway um he was one of them um but yeah i, I think i think cam will be okay I, i'm really curious to see i, I think he's uh, a really interesting story i really liked what he said i like the way he came across he's very confident um it's not an easy thing and like you don't want a rookie replacing a hall of famer you, you know you've got a guy who's uh he was a high pick uh he's he started a full season or 11 games he's been around kelsey for two years um and like he's he's got a really really good veteran Pro Bowl guard to his left. Uh, he's got Lane over there to his right, a couple guys down. Um, I think it's a really good situation. So I'm curious to see how it'll go, but I, I feel pretty good about it. Yeah, I feel good about it, but I also think there's a very real chance this offensive line takes a little step back this year, and I think that's natural. It's possible. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see. I, I think it's also possible that I think so much of the O-line is chemistry and just, you know, playing together. Um, I, I think this offensive line has a chance to look better just because I think the offense is going to be more efficient, more explosive, more unpredictable, more varied. Uh, I think that'll all help the O-line. Like if, if Jalen's a sitting duck back there, the O-line's going to look bad, even though like a lot of the sacks aren't his fault. So um, I I think they'll be okay. Okay, I mean I, I thought the offensive line looked fine last year. You gave you gave up a lot of sacks. I, I don't think were their fault. Okay, yeah. yeah. I mean I I think they're not going to be as good this year. I bet they allow fewer sacks. Okay, that's not what we're talking about though. No, I understand that. Okay, yeah. They also didn't run the ball great a, a lot of to, a lot of the time. But anyway, I think the offense will be a lot better and i think the offensive line at times is going to look better because of that okay give me something else from talking to those players well we talked to um um uh, we talked to uh bg who i just always love just listening to him talk i could listen to him talk all day um he made some some look he's going into year 15 it's never happened before um one thing he said that i really liked was you know i'm not just here to be um, you know, I'm not just, I don't know, I'm paraphrasing. I'm not just here to be a leader and be the old guy. I, you know, I'm going to, I want to contribute because that's the only way you have credibility. That's the only way he's like, I'm going to talk my talk, but if I'm not contributing and working, 
and, and helping out in whatever role I'm given, whether it's five snaps or, or, or 20 snaps, um, I don't have credibility. So um, he knows he's not just here. I mean, a big part of why he's here is to be a leader. Fletch is gone. Kelsey's gone. He's kind of the next guy. Um, but also, um, when he's out there, he's got to play well, and he knows that. It is fun that he's going out in this way. It's like not many players get to do this. And it's it's funny to think that Brandon Graham's having this farewell tour, but he is. He's He's been pretty clear that he always wanted to play 15 years. He's in year 15, so he's going to soak up every single step along the way. And that includes like the first phase of the offseason program. Like he's just thrilled to be there. And, and that's kind of cool. I, I forget who was it. Was it Jalen or or one of the offensive players said might have been, I think it was Cam Jurgens, maybe, but they said that like, you know, BG's in hours early and then he like greets the offense when they get into the, the weight room. Like it's just it's fun to have him around. And you're right, like they wouldn't have brought him back if he couldn't still play, but all that other stuff does matter. Yeah. And and sometimes I roll my eyes about like leadership stuff because ultimately it's about like who can play but right. with brandon graham I, I really do think there's a, a a tangible benefit to having him around the building yeah i mean he's one of the most positive people i've ever met and um i mean I, gosh i've known him for 15 years we've had so many really deep talks about it had nothing to do with football um but i love his outlook i love his outlook on life uh i mean he's just one of the more positive people i've i've ever known and um He's been through a lot of hardships and they've helped shape him into the person he is. And I mean, it took a while to get where he is to become, to kind of have this personality uh, because that's not where he was when he first got here. Uh, but he's, he's grown so much and uh, man, I'm going to miss him too when he's gone. So I'm going to, I'm going to enjoy every day. Uh, hopefully he's at his locker. I'm sure he will be. I'll talk to him every day, but uh, yeah, it's, it's really important that he's still here. I think with with Kelsey and Fletch retiring, uh, I mean they'd be fine if he wasn't. But uh, man, for those young defensive players, not just the line, but and really everybody on the team. I mean Brandon Graham is a guy that everyone listens to, everyone believes in. Um, I mean, even during the collapse last year, he was like the one guy who was so popular. We're, we're just about to snap out of this. I know we are. We're still going to the Super Bowl. Our goals haven't changed. I just think that's important for for everyone to hear that kind of stuff, and and it's so genuine. He really believes it. It's, it's who he is. Uh, I'm a big fan. Yeah, and his. Uh, I'm a big fan, Gio. That's a stretch. Uh, you mentioned some of the younger players on that line. I think Nolan Smith is the guy that sticks out for me. And and Brandon was asked about Nolan a little bit. He he said he sees a little bit more confidence. And Nolan this year just having a year under his belt. And look, it was a relatively disappointing rookie season. Didn't get to play an awful lot. Didn't have uh, a lot of stats or anything. And we'll see what his role is this year. They they have Bryce Huff. They have Josh Sweat. Brandon's still there. But I in an ideal world, Nolan Smith becomes the third guy in that rotation this year. And Brandon Graham's able to play even a smaller percentage of the snaps. Yeah, and BG said, look, Nolan knows – uh, people are doubting him. He knows people are, you know, have, have questions about him. He said uh, he knows that. And I keep telling him, look, Josh Sweat's proven himself. Bryce Huff's proven, you know, proven himself. He had 10 sacks last year. Uh, and, you know, you haven't proven yourself. And you got to do that this year. Um, that's good for Nolan to hear. Uh, uh, last couple of things that we we learned on Wednesday from the players. Uh, Nicobe Dean chatted with us a little bit. He said he's almost 100%. That he's not there yet is, I mean, that's a, a significant injury, uh, but he still seems pretty confident in his abilities. I asked him about maybe playing the weak side linebacker position instead of the <laughs> mic, and he kind of looked at me like I was a crazy person. He's like, it's it's linebacker. I'll be fine. But I think he was the type of player who did take pride in having the green dot and, and being the defensive um, person who would get the calls. So... You know, if, if Devin White has that responsibility, I, I am genuinely curious how Nicobe's handling that. But uh, on the outside, he, he's all smiles, ready to play. Yeah, yeah, he's one of those guys. I mean, there's a bunch of them, a lot of them from the same college who have a lot to prove this coming year. 
Um, and, and he's one of them, you know, going into year three, uh, he's got to, he's got to show up. He's got to stay healthy and he's got to be a force and we'll see. But yeah, he said, uh, the boot, uh, came off in February. I think he said early February. He said early it was February. off by the time the Super Bowl came around. Yeah, he did say that. And, um, he wouldn't be specific, but he said, um, he expects to be cleared soon, very soon. So, uh, cleared to do everything. So, I mean, he's already, uh, I thought he looked good. He looks good. I thought he looked a little bigger. Um, it's kind of hard to tell, but uh, I'm really curious to see what kind of year he has. He's a great kid. Uh, he's putting in the work. I just don't know if he's good enough. Yeah, I don't know. It's it's funny because he's now like all of a sudden people call him injury prone. It's like it's one he year of injury. Practice in college. Yeah, I mean, it's one year of injuries. And the, I, I think it's it's you add it to there was like talk about injury concern when he was coming out of college. Is that the reason he fell? I, I don't know. Maybe. He is, and, and I, I think it's like the injury-prone label also attaches to him because he's an undersized yeah. player at that position, and I get all that, but I don't know. I'm I, I'm kind of curious to see if he can stay on the field and, and what kind of player he can be. Yeah, I'm, I'm really curious. Anything else that, that no. we have to talk about? We talked to Goddard. There, w- there wasn't anything super um, – say he's just – you know, he feels good, he feels healthy, and um, his goals haven't changed as far as what he wants to accomplish as a player. And I think there's a little bit of a sense out there that he's a declining player. Uh, I think he's aware of that. And I, I think he wants to go out there and, and show it's not true. Yeah. And a bunch of the, the guys talked about just Saquon Barkley yeah. being in the building. It seems like he's already making a, a positive impression on all those guys. Jalen Hurts especially said like just having him in the weight room, competing with him in sprints and, and, and lifting, like all that stuff, you can kind of already see the competitive juices flowing with those guys. Yeah. Yeah. It's exciting. And yeah. the, the guys seem to be, you know, when there's like, I mean, somebody perceived as a superstar like Saquon, like NFL players get excited to have him in, in the building. And uh, so, you know, we'll see how it goes. All right. Let's take a break. We'll bring in Barrett and we'll have some draft discussion on the other side. You deserve a car that thrills you, a car that puts goosebumps on your goosebumps. At Nissan, we got everything from turbocharged SUVs to 100% electric vehicles that will make your heart beat faster. Experience the thrill for yourself and shop your local Nissan store at NissanUSA.com today. Celebrity cook Steve Martorano brings his Italian-American cooking back home to Philly. Enjoy Martorano's Prime at Rivers Casino and Steve's famous meatballs with Sunday gravy, prime steaks, and more. Make reservations at Martorano's Prime on Open Table. All right, we're back on the Eagle Eye Podcast presented by Nissan. We got Barrett Brooks with us. B. Brooks, how you doing, man? Good, good, good. How's it going, fellas? We're getting ready for the draft. We're a week away, so uh, we have a game to play, and we'll get to that in a second, but First off, like this pre-draft process, have you fallen in love with any prospects? What do you think the Eagles do? Of course, you know, I fell in love with Cooper DeGene. That was my guy. Um, I just think he's so versatile. Swiss Army knife, can play wide corner, play slot, maybe maybe can play slot. I saw him play slot a lot with Iowa. Uh, I think they can put him in safety. He played a lot in a position where he was deep and was able to go out there and, you know, attack what's in front of him and make some big plays. And plus he's a returner, so... I like everything that he brings to the table, but you worried about those stiff hips. You know what? That's kind of why I can see him at the safety position in the slot position. So, you know, that's why, you know, but I mean, he's an athlete, man. He's one of the best athletes in the draft. No question. I mean, he, he's got hops like he's a, a real hooper. He's just a great athlete. So I'm, I like him a lot, but we know how he, we know the trenches, you know what he's going to do. <laughs> yeah. So Cooper DeGene is one name I have, in this hat, and this is a special hat. This is actually a Pro Football Hall of Fame hat Ruben got go. me when he went, I think, to the Brian Dawkins induction. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah that there, was your yeah. gift. Yeah, yeah this yeah. is my gift hat. I so it's like getting $400 in the gift shop at the Hall of Fame. It's <laughs> nice. Not on this hat, I hope. About half of it. Okay. All right. <laughs> so this is uh, an important hat, but it's also important today because there are a bunch of names of potential first round prospects. And I, I excluded like the top receivers. They'll be well out of range. No Joe Alton here. I think he'll be out of range. No quarterbacks because that doesn't make sense. But a bunch of options for the Eagles in the first round. And I'm just going to pull a couple out of a hat and we'll kind of put them against each other. And for some of them, we'll include trade up, trade down scenarios. So 
Let's play this game. This is all random. All right. I have two in front of me. The first one is Johnny Newton, the defensive tackle from Illinois. Defensive tackle is a position we have not talked about very much. We Versus should. Darius Robinson. This is a fun one. So um, maybe both of these guys would be trade back candidates. Like if you're at 22 and you don't love the value, you trade down. Which way would you guys go on, on these two? Rube, why do you start? Um, I mean, I can't see them taking either of them at 22. Um, but uh, I'd say probably Robinson if I'm gonna if I'm gonna move down a few spots to the end of the first. Um, yeah, I like him, and I th- I think, um, I mean, I think there is a chance how he'll tr- trade down. I think it's more likely to trade up, but um, I would say Robinson. You know what? I think Johnny's one of those guys that he can come in and be explosive. Yes, we've spent the last two uh, the drafts thing. on. Yeah, but it's a position of need in the aspect that how many, how many, you know, three techniques do we have? I mean, how many nose guards do we have? Yeah, uh, you got Tui, what's his name? Um, Tui Pelotu. Tui, Tui Pelotu, yeah, yeah. The Tui Pelotu. Uh, Davis. And then after that, you know, you got those end types. If you're going to run a three, four, you know, you got Williams will probably play at that end, you know, head up on the tackle type of defensive end. I know they're going to run it with an under and an over, um, but you know, you need more players than they have at the D line position. I mean, they're going to put sweat at a linebacker F type of guy. I don't know if he'll play directly over the tackle in that three, four front. Then, you know, you got Carter and then it gets slim after that. I mean, who else do they have? You know, so I think they need a big guy uh, that can play both, kind of like a Carter guy. I know, I know they come a dime a dozen, but a Williams Carter type of guy that can come in and play because we just don't have enough of that position. You know, I really didn't think about it because you've always had flex there, but with him being gone, you know, you, somebody's going to have to, you know, lead that chase. You know, flex played what, 80%, 70% of the slaps, snaps last year? That's a lot of snaps we have to pick up. Yeah, that's fair. It's, it's you know, Newton's probably more of a pure three tech. And then Robinson, excuse me, is kind of like a, a more versatile player, kind of like Milton Williams a little bit, can play inside, can yeah, play outside. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah I, I think defensive line, as much as people are thinking that's not on their radar, it's it's always on their radar. It's true. <laughs> yes, yes. All right, let's go to the next one here. Okay, this is fun. So we have one that would be a trade-up scenario and one that would be a stay put. So Olu Fashanu, the offensive tackle from Penn State, versus Nate Wiggins, the cornerback from Clemson. I would trade up for uh, that tackle. That kid's an athlete. You know what I'm saying? He's a big guy. He can play tackle, probably play both. They can cross-train to play both. Him going to, you know, uh, the school of hard knocks with, you know, being, you know, in that system, I would trade up for him. I would trade up for him. What do you think, Rube? Um, I probably, I mean, I like both players. I, I'd probably go Wiggins. I, I just, I want to get a young cornerback in here. And I, I know, I mean, we talked, we talked on our, on our mock draft about his deficiencies against the run, but man, the guy's a great cover corner. Um, I mean, he's sticky. He can run. Uh, I'll find someone else to cover, to, to defend the run. Uh, I, I like Wiggins. You know, I'm going to tell you this also, Rube. I was talking to, you know, like I gave the story in the draft, you know, we did our, our little draft thing with corners cover. You don't, you don't necessarily need them to stop the run. They're not out there. And some corners think that way. But you just can't take away from that 4-2 speed. That's makeup speed that, you know, you just can't coach. So he'll never really be out of position because he's fast enough to get there. So you, you could, you know, you could definitely – you know, changed my mind with that pick. Definitely changed that mind. But I was looking at it from a Howie Roseman standpoint. Sure. And he would want to go O line, but oh, if it's right. Howie, yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> I mean, it's no contest. Right, it's, right. It's for right. Shawnee. All right, let's go to the next one here. I just pulled them out. Uh, one. He's enjoying this way too much. Right. Yes, he is. Yes, so he we is. have tight end Brock Bowers okay. from Georgia versus AD Mitchell, the receiver from Texas. Now I'll let you decide if Brock Bowers is a. a a stick and pick or if he's a slight trade up 
I think AD Mitchell probably, maybe you can stick and pick him, but maybe more likely a trade down. I'm thinking trade down also. Yeah. Yeah. Which, uh, I, honestly, the, the first round tight end scares me. And I know Brock Bowers is like a special player. They don't hit. I, I think that's real. I think it's Gordon just a tough Davis. position to evaluate. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'm taking Bowers. Yeah, me too. Yeah, I, I mean, you're right. It, it's, you know, the history isn't great. And, uh, you know, the kid Atlanta took is is fresh in our minds. Uh, but, man, this guy is is such a weapon. Uh, great hands. He yeah. can run. Um, his effort on the line of scrimmage is, is good. Uh, I think he's got the whole package. If you look at him as a weapon and not a tight end, man, I, I, I really like the player. So it might be, a, it might be a little risky just because of the position, but, um, yeah. And I, and I like Mitchell. I think Mitchell would be a fun guy to have around, but yeah, he would. I'm going Bowers. Well, you know what? I mean, just listening to Howie, uh, the past couple of days and the way he, in the, even the way the, the head coach talked about, Saquon Barkley, not necessarily just being a running back, but just being a special player. I think Brock Bowers is that special player. You know, he's been special ever since he got there. I remember his first game he played actually uh, was inside the truck uh, producing the game when he first got to Georgia. And ever since he stepped on the field, he's been a great weapon for him. So I think he can do the same thing at this level. I mean, we saw we had with Zach Ertz and we had Dallas Goddard there. You know, you didn't know we were running or passing because, you know, you could always put Ertz out at the slot or at the wing position, and then you can have Dallas Goddard blocking the edge, you know, or flip-flop those. You know, that's – you just never know with that. And that 12 personnel can be 11 personnel when you have special tight ends like that. Yeah, maybe I'm overthinking it. You know, Brock Bowers is a better player. And I'm thinking, like, you're trading down possibly – Right for right. AD, and you're getting another pick, but you know, ultimately, like you're trying to get the best player in the first round because that's where you get your studs most of the time. I don't, you know, I don't know. You know when you're talking about the tail end of a draft, when you're talking about like twenty on down, you know, is that a second rounder or is it, you know, late first? You know, kind of be that's the thing. Right. And Howie's yeah. track record in the twenties is pretty abysmal. Yes, <laughs> yes. When we traded up. For uh, Dillard. <laughs> yeah. Just signed with the Packers today, by the way. Oh, did he? Yeah. yeah. Good for Andre. We'll see him in week one down in uh, Brazil. Yeah, if he's still there. <laughs> All right. Next one is two stick and pick guys. Uh, we're right up Barrett's alley here. Big guys. We already talked about uh, Johnny uh, Newton, but how about Byron Murphy from Texas versus Jackson Powers Johnson? So we're talking two interior linemen, one on defense, one on offense. Which way would you rather go there? Well, I mean, I'm kind of partial to to old linemen, and especially you know when you're inside and you can play center and guard, you know. But yeah, I, I, you know, a powerful guy. That's what I think of him. Powerful guy. You know, he's 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 versatile. He can you know move guys around. You know, but when you're talking about just straight, I I I don't know what when you look at Murphy, is he a product of how good the guys around him? You know, kind of like same situation with Davis. I mean, he had his counterpart on that D line was three sixty six. You know, and, you know, him, he was that, you know, straight up the field, jump the gap. I mean, you can't take him away from what he brings to the table as far as being an athlete. But, man, you know, it he had a great players around him also. Does the Powers Johnson thing scary of just like positional value if you were to draft an interior only offensive lineman in, in the first round? Not if you trade yeah. down for me. Well, yeah. I don't think he's a trade down. I think if you're taking Powers John, I, I think he's a – a stick and pick at 22. Do you? Yeah. I think it might be a little high for him. Yeah. Okay. But so so you would entertain it if it's a slight trade down? Yeah. No. Yeah. Well, you just trade down, but I, I just like you said, I think he is. Uh, they don't think, I think the way this this team thinks is about interior guys because they think that, you know, if you can play. Well, anything, they found a Hall of Famer in the sixth round. So, right. <laughs> yeah. Hall of Famer in the sixth round. In the seventh round, they got probably – uh, one of the top three, top four left tackles in the country. But as far as interior <laughs> guys, I mean, oh, they got a couple of second round guys in there now. Right. Sean, I guess was Sean Andrews the last interior guy they drafted? Well, there was some thought fireman Danny would be a guard. Yeah. What was he? I, I don't he know. He was a fireman. Oh yeah. Oh, there you go. Right there. He was a fireman. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, as I would, I wouldn't take an interior old lineman in the you know top fifteen picks, but. If it was if it was at the end of the first round, I I, I don't mind it, and I I like Jackson Paris Johnson. Me too. I like Byron Murphy. I think I'd go Murphy on that. Okay. All right. Next one. 
One is a trade up. One, I'll, I'll call a stick and pick, but maybe a, a trade down. The trade up is Troy Fontenot, offensive tackle, maybe offensive guard from Washington versus Brian Thomas Jr., wide receiver from LSU. See, that's 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 really, really, really tough. <laughs> really tough because I think both guys are are trade ups. You know, I mean, you know about those receivers from LSU and, you know, the tandem that they had there at LSU. I can see the same tandem. I've seen the t- same tandem, you know, three drafts before, well, two drafts before that have been magical, you know, been the greatest, you know, tandems I've seen in college football for a long time. You know, I mean, Odell Beckham and those guys, and then you turn around, you know, you got, I mean, it's just one of those situations where I, I mean, I love, you know, what production you have at that wide receiver position when it goes to LSU. But man, when you talk about a guy that's a great athlete, that's versatile enough, you can put him inside, but he has sweet feet. He can jump guys. You know, he's one of the better athletes as far as being a tackle. He's only 6'4", and that's the only thing about him. But man, I, I do love his game. I do love the fact that he can jump out there. He sets like he's already in Stoutland uh, University. He sets just like him. He tries to get out on guys quick. So I think he'll fit perfect in the system. So if I'm thinking like the Eagles, I'm going to go the way of the offensive lineman. But I don't want to get fooled like we did and, and and not go get a receiver that can be a big time receiver in the offense. You know, you know what's crazy about Brian Thomas? He caught 68 passes this year. 17 were touchdowns. <laughs> Every fourth catch was a touchdown. He averaged over 17 yards. So I think he kind of got overlooked because of neighbors, but yeah. he's really good. And yeah, you're right. If we're thinking like Howie, no. Right. <laughs> but thinking like Rube, um, <laughs> I'm intrigued by Brian Thomas Jr. Yeah, look, and, and I think he's closer to the top three receivers in this draft than the rest yeah. of them. Yeah, uh, sure. I think. Yeah, so I, I think he's been a little overlooked. But Fatanu's the guy, right? Like, he's one of – there are like four, to me, really intriguing trade-up possibilities. He's one of them. I, I think he's worth moving up to get. Yes. You know, if, he, if he's anywhere around that 15 range, you got to go get him. All right, next one here. Graham Barton, interior offensive line from Duke versus J.C. Latham, offensive tackle from Alabama. I I like that's a good comparison because they're kind of. Yeah, I think Latham is probably a a slight trade up and and Barton is probably a a pick and stick. there. Yeah, I mean, you know how I feel about Latham. Uh, I know how you feel about Latham. Love him, love him. Um, and I just, I mean, I, I got a mock draft running next week, and he's my guy. I got the Eagles trading up for him at uh, taking him at eighteen. Yeah. Um, yeah, he's you know he can come in and play guard from the get go, uh, and then when Lane hangs it up, you got you got to tackle. So, um, Barton's an interesting guy too. Um, he played tackle. That's played what he played lot, at Duke. Yeah, played a lot of tackle at Duke. Yeah. Played more tackle yeah. than guard, but he's got those short arms, Barrett. So uh, he'll probably be a guard in the NFL. Um, he'll be a good guard in the NFL. Yeah, he'll I think he probably really will be. Good guard. I don't yeah. think he's really a tackle. Yeah. Um, he's slight. I mean, he's, he's got to put on some weight. But, um, yeah, uh, I'll go Latham, but I wouldn't mind Barton as a consolation prize. I'll tell you about Barton, um, and he's physical, too. He's nasty. nasty. Yeah. I, I mean, I love his attitude. And, you know, Latham's They put him down for, like, 10 personal fouls. Right. You, know, you got to. Before you even start. <laughs> I love him. I mean, he he's a he's a hard nosed kid too, really hard nosed kid. So I, I would, I mean, that's you know, pick your poison with with both guys. Yeah, trade up for Latham. That's the, yeah, that's the move there. All right, next one, uh, Edge Leatu Latu from UCLA versus oops, I picked two there versus oh, Quinion Mitchell, cornerback from Toledo. My favorite guys are popping up here. Yeah, when you uh, those are two of your favorite guys right there, right. Yeah. But I mean, is is it is the medical history? Uh, He's been fine since he right. You might yeah. retired. Yeah, you know. So it's. I mean, I think he only missed one game uh, once he transferred to UCLA. So um, all the medicals have been fine on him. Um, He's so good, man. He yeah. is really, really. I mean, good. I think he'll drop because of the concerns. Right, right. Um, with potential the, to be there at twenty-two because of them. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I could really see that happening, man. Um. That's a tough call because I mean the corner is so good, um, and I don't. I'm not worried about him playing in 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 the, in the MAC. You know, I mean, he has no, a, he had a great a senior great, bowl, great senior bowl. I 
He would have been great at any school. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. You mean, but I like the fact that he was like, he could have easily transferred and and gone to SEC school easy. And he said, you know, Toledo is the one school that stuck by me. So I want to stick by them. I like that. He's good, man. He went to senior bowl against good competition. Wild there did the same, the combine he he's CB one in this draft to me. Yeah. Well, there's no question about that. And, I mean, he solidified it already on tape. You know, when we looked at him on tape, me and you, Dave, and we just saw how good he was and how his hips and, you know, way, the way he, you know, would cut routes off from receivers. And he was he was the total – I, I, I called a game, not this year, but last year I called a game. Um, I forget who they were playing against. Uh, I think it was like Central Michigan or something. And they had some special receivers on that team. And, I mean, wherever he went – you could just, you know, shut that receiver down because he was that good and that good of a player as far as technique and everything. So Central Michigan always is loaded a wide receiver. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, who was, who was that good wide receiver that was there? <laughs> but again, you know, if it's Howie, he's, you know, he's taken a lot to, but yeah. man. Which wouldn't be bad either, though. Yeah, right? it wouldn't be. It wouldn't be. But uh, if I if I had – Man, that's a tough call. That's really tough. I would take Mitchell. Yeah. I'd have to. Yeah, I'd have to move up and get him. All right. Let's get to let's do a little more rapid fire. We got to get through these. All right. Um, this one, Zach Frazier. This would be a probably a trade down interior offensive line from West Virginia versus Jared Verse, Edge from, from Florida State. We'll call him a pick and stick. I, I think he's probably gone by the time they get to 22, but I want to make this interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's no question I will verse. Verse is versatile. Verse can First. You know, he's he, he, he's special as far as, you know, he can get up the field, stop the run, you know, hold the point. I like him. Yeah, I like any any edge from uh, from Albany. <laughs> <laughs> that, that program just churns him out. But, yeah, I mean, look, versus uh, versus an intriguing guy. I, I'd love to see him here. Yeah. All right. Next one. Chop Robinson versus Terry on Arnold. Now, this is an interesting one because you're going to have to give up a lot to move up to get Terry on Arnold. Whereas Chop Robinson, you'd probably, you could probably trade down and get him. Yeah. Yeah, probably. Yeah. I mean, Terry on, you know, I mean, he's, uh, he's shown that he's probably the number two corner in his draft, you know? So yeah, you would have to, well, I, yeah, you you would have you could trade down and get chop. Yeah. yeah. Which one would you do? I'm trying to get a stud. I'm trying to get Terry on. Most of the the trade up options, I'm taking. Yeah, we have to stick. Well, you we said just stick. took Quinion Mitchell, so I I got my corner. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take chop. I'll get both of them. Right. All right. But yeah, it would be it would be Terry. But I, you know, yeah, it would have to be yeah. rapid fire. Kool Aid McKinstry, Amarius Mims. Ooh. That's that's another one, you know. He's probably the number three or four corner. In the I'll draft. take Mims. I'm I'm intrigued by him. He's so young. Too. I just think he's got so much upside. He does. He's young too, you know. So I mean, he only started what eight games, but still though, you know, mm-hmm. like, he, upside's he, huge. Yeah, yeah, huge, yeah, huge upside. Yeah, I'm going with Mims also. Cooper DeGene or Tyler Guyton. See, once again, you put yeah, me in we a know bad position. You know, bad position. I mean, Tyler Guyton, man, come on. You know, he's he's good, but. I'm taking Guyton. I'm I'm taking Guyton also. Are you really? <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna take Guyton. Uh, I mean, I mean, big guy don't, can don't move. anybody tell that kid in <laughs> Iowa what's going on here. I'm not. I'm taking Cooper DeGene there. Are you? Whoa. Really? Okay. Yeah, Whoa. yeah. I don't necessarily see it with Guyton. The last one we'll do here: a big trade up for Talis Fuaga or a big trade up for Dallas Turner. That was a huge. That's a big. That's a huge turnover for, yeah. for, for Turner. Yeah, we're saying maybe maybe a team falls in love with one of the other edges, right? Maybe they yeah. fall in love with Latu, or they fall in love with Jared Verse, and for Could some reason Dallas Turner it. slips to like ten, eleven ish. Go get him. I'll take Turner. Me too. I mean, the same situation as Carter we had last year. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't. I don't like the chances there. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's wrap this up. We appreciate. The Time Barrett. Uh, if you enjoy the Thank Eagle Eye you. podcast, please do us a favor, rate and subscribe wherever you get your pods. If you're watching on YouTube, please click the like button, subscribe there as well. For Barrett and Rube, I'm Dave. This has been Eagle Eye presented by Nissan. We'll talk to you next week, everyone.